Hello, Radio 1 News Feeds election debate. Another chance for you to talk about the issues you've told us are important this general election. Yeah, we're here with about 100 young voters live in Edinburgh. <laughs> They are here to talk tonight about the economy, getting a job, trying to buy a house, paying the bills. And whether you're with us live on Radio 1, 1 Extra, the BBC News Channel, or watching us on repeat later, or on the iPlayer, the conversation is happening online as well. Just use the hashtag Newsbeat. My name's Jenna. I'm a final year student from Edinburgh, and zero hour contracts have given me the opportunity to gain work experience while studying at uni. I'm Eva, I'm 20, I'm a student, I graduate next year and I'm really worried about having to try and get a job. I'm James, I'm 22 and I want to know what politicians will do to help with rising rent bills. Alright, we'd love to hear from you as well. I'm going to be checking your tweets tonight. What do you want to say about the state of the economy? Get in touch using the hashtag Newsbeat. Now, at all our debates, as well as the audience, we've been hearing from some of the political parties who want your vote. And joining us tonight, live in Edinburgh, Jenny Mara is here from the Labour Party in Scotland. Jonathan Arnott is here to represent UKIP. Hamza Youssef is from the SNP. Danny Alexander will talk on behalf of the Lib Dems. He was Chief Secretary to the Treasury in the Coalition Government. And to represent the Conservatives, Gavin Brown. Welcome to all of you. <laughs> now, let's start with this. Earlier this year, Newsbeat <coughs> asked 6,018 to 24 year olds about the types of policies they'd be looking out for when it comes to deciding how to vote. Now, one third told us keeping down the cost of everyday bills should be a priority for the government. So, how are you guys managing to pay your bills? My name's Poppy. I'm a 23 year old care assistant from Newcastle. I work 12 hour shifts at night and I earn £6.50 per hour, the minimum wage. At the end of most months, I either don't have enough money because I'm trying to go to university to train to be a nurse next year. And if I can, I put money towards that. And if I can't, I just have to think, oh, the next month. And then it's the next month. And then I have to wonder whether I'll be able to do it at all, you know, for such backbreaking work to not afford to be able to achieve my dream. So how much are you surviving on? Well, my rent's about 300 and then other bills are about 200 and I get about 800 to 1,000 per month. So there doesn't tend to be much left after that. I also have a dog. Okay. So there's not a lot. So money there as well. <laughs> yeah. <All right. laughs> Hello, my name's Struan. I'm 22. I'm originally from Thurso, but I'm studying here at Sunday in Glasgow. I'm right. through in Edinburgh today. I, like so many other young people, have started my own business. And because our great British businesses are the jobs factory for this country, I just want to know what uh, the politicians are going to do to help on entrepreneurs like me. What type of business is it you're trying to set up? Uh, I've set up a whiskey business and we're based in Glasgow in East Park. Yep. Okay, very nice. Um, I'm Liam, I'm 23 years old and I'm originally from Hoyk in the Scottish Borders. I graduated two years ago and I've done internships, unpaid internships and I finally found a, a full-time job up in Edinburgh and yet almost more, in fact more than half my month's salary goes on rent. The typical house price in Edinburgh is £2,300,000, that's just unaffordable for so many people. At school we're told to work hard to get into university, told to work hard at university to get a good job and yet those jobs simply aren't out there. I believe that so many of us have been sold a false promise that if you work hard, we'll get a great job at the end of it. Okay. Well, this is something we've been hearing about in the months leading up to the general election. Politicians love talking about hard-working people. You've worked hard. Ordinary working people. 24 million working people. Work hard. Always put working families first. But for many young people, it can be hard to find a job in the first place. As a student, I'm looking for a part-time job but I often find that by the time I apply for the position, it's already been filled, or they're looking for someone with way more experience. David Cameron says the government have created a thousand jobs a day over the last five years. What we've been doing is getting two million more people into work since I became Prime Minister. That's a thousand people every day. But is that being felt by people at the bottom of the ladder? I'm a student. I work every hour under the sun and I can still barely afford to live. Politicians keep telling us that the economy is getting better, but from where I'm standing, it doesn't seem like it. There are jobs available. They might not be the ones you want, but you just have to try hard and look broad. I think that the minimum wage should be a living wage. 
if work doesn't give you a decent standard of living, then what is the point in working? Do you know what living wage is? Well, in, well, it's different in different parts of the okay, country. Well, outside London. I, I don't have the figures in my head. Right. It's 9.15 an hour in London, 7.85 an hour in the rest of the UK. I don't want the minimum wage to go up at a rate at which the experts tell me unemployment will increase. More than 20% of workers is on less than a living wage. So we will increase the minimum wage to £8 an hour by 2020. Small businesses are the backbone of our economy, so to raise minimum wage would threaten those businesses and potentially raise unemployment. Just last week my wage went up, from £6.40 to £6.60. As a student living at home, this is fine but I would really struggle to rely on this as a full-time wage. Another hot topic at this election has been zero-hour contracts. Could you live on one? Not, that's not the question. The question is... Well, it's is, the question I'm asking. Well, yeah, <laughs> no, but the point is some people choose a zero-hour contract. So many workers say, I can't plan my life if I don't know from but one week to the next. Some workers also say, only a third of them say they want to work more hours, so two thirds of them actually might well be happy with what they're doing. It's, it's, there's an issue about the number of hours, but there's an issue of the unpredictability of the hours. I have been working on a zero hours contract, and the flexibility really suits me. If the only option had been 16 hours, I wouldn't have been able to take the job. Zero hours contracts have helped my business to grow and remain flexible, but it's also been the contract of choice for our employees. Without them, my business would be at risk, and so would their jobs. It's the biggest increase in apprenticeships since the last war. When you take in consideration the cost of living and rent, the wage you get on an apprenticeship, it's just not cutting it. UKIP say being in the EU is damaging prospects for British workers. They want British companies to be able to choose to employ British staff. Labour and the Lib Dems want to see more apprenticeships, while the Conservatives say they will help businesses create two million extra jobs over the next five years. OK, so lots of different opinions there. Let's get some more of your stories. Hi there, I'm Sonny. I'm 24 from Edinburgh. Uh, I've also recently started my own business and to support my support from the government has came in the form of the new enterprise allowance. Um, this is only £50 a week and runs out after six months. The only other forms of support out there are a Princess Trust loan, which obviously being under 25 is quite a big commitment to take a loan. Um, so I've have, had to cut back on my social life and sell my motorbike to support myself. So I want to know what's the government going to do, especially to support younger people starting their own businesses. OK, so what type of business is it? Um, so I've started Tipple Box, mm -hmm. uh, Tipple Box, which is a cocktails by post business. OK, so how much money are you actually living on? Uh, so approximately about £50 a week, um, and it just means that I pay for my travel during the days, um, and at weekends, you know, have to pay pretty much next to nothing and can't really afford a social life. OK, let's put that to Danny Alexander. Could you live on £50 a week? No, no I don't think I could. Um, and <coughs> you're obviously working very hard to get your business going. There are also st things called startup loans available from the government which are there to help businesses, particularly for people aged under 30, uh, to get going. The other thing that I'm really pushing hard is the idea that uh, when you're working, the government should take less of your money in income tax, especially if you're working on a low income. So we Liberal Democrats have insisted that the amount you earn that's tax free has risen from £6,500 to over £10,000 uh, in this parliament. That's worth £825 a year to a lot of workers that are no, no longer handing over to the government. Uh, and th this lady here was talking uh, about working full time on the minimum wage. So we want to raise the personal allowance further to 12 and a half thousand pounds so that someone working full time on the min minimum wage is not paying any of their money over to the government in income tax. So people can keep more of the money that they, they are earning for themselves. But why does that money run out after six months? So the new enterprise allowance was set up as so something newly created, didn't exist five years ago. <laughs> Uh, in the benefit system to help encourage people to set up their own business. Uh, otherwise, if you claim job seekers allowance, you're required to be actively seeking work all the time, whereas you presumably are spending a lot of time getting your business going, and in due course that will start up, you'll earn a living from it, you won't need to rely on that anymore. The startup loan is there to help a business get some initial money to get going. Sometimes you have initial outlays that you need to make. And look, I would say that it's not the government that creates jobs, it's businesses like yours, and like, I think it was Struan over there who's got the whiskey business, um, you're the ones who are creating the two million jobs, not the government. What we have to do is to try and put the right support in place to enable you to do that. That's why we need a strong economy, but also a fair society so that you have those opportunities. Jenny Mara, your party often gets accused of being anti-business. Mm -hmm. What's your response to the story you heard? Well, I mean, I, I think I was chatting to, to the guys before we started. Really interesting people that are running, you know, and starting up their own businesses here in Scotland and I'm sure across the UK. But one of our ideas 
here in Scotland is that we um, give young people £1,600. Now, this is equivalent to what we would spend on university or college fees if they were going into education. But the guys were rightly saying to me at the start that, you know, no, education is not for everyone. And some people just want to get out there, get their hands dirty, get into, uh, to get into work, maybe start their own business. So we're going to put in place a £1,600 grant that they can use really for anything. Some people might use it for driving lessons. I think these guys would probably use it as capital to put into their businesses and I'm sure so other people would find great use for that too. What about the amount of money? You talk about apprenticeships as well. What mm -hmm. about the amount of money that apprentices get? Do you think that needs to go up? I, I certainly do. You know, the, uh, the minimum wage for apprentices in this country is £2.73. Mm -hmm. Now, if you couldn't it's live set, on set £50, to go up, £50 though, it's £3.30 Yes, but that is still mm -hmm. completely an unlivable wage. I mean, when I started work at 15, which is over 20 years ago, I was earning £2 an hour in my, uh, you know, part-time job. It's only a pound more than that. But, I mean, that is just not sustainable. And the, the sad thing is there are apprentices, modern apprentices here, run by the Scottish Government, that they certify as apprentices and they're like stacking shelves in Superdrug and that is certified as a modern apprenticeship but yet these people are earning £2.73 an hour. It's not good enough and these wages need to go up and that is why Labour is committed to raising the minimum wage to £8 by 2020. But unemployment's at a record low, the economy's growing, all these things that you said wouldn't happen. What, what's your response Well, so to many that? people that have these jobs actually have to stack up the jobs, two or three jobs and I, I don't think that's acceptable at all and I don't buy the argument you know, that the economy will fail because people are paid a decent wage that allows them to live. I just don't accept that can, at can all. I, can I come on? I, I think a, a lot of these points actually, are, you know, the SNP would agree with. We want to raise the minimum wage actually more than anybody else to £8.70 uh, by 2020. We recognise uh, what Sonny's saying and other business people are saying is we want to increase uh, employment allowance. And on top of that, actually, we believe in uh, increasing public spending, not cutting it, so that actually your money doesn't run out after six months. But there's an, there's an issue here that nobody's talked about. Uh, and then I'm very keen that if we get a group of SNP MPs, we've got to tackle. And that's the fact that still in the 21st century, we have women doing the same job as men, but paid less for it. So I think it's... Uh, if, we have, if, we, if we have a group of SNP MPs, I make the commitment and the promise in this in our manifesto, that we will urge the UK government to take action to the Equal Pay Act, because not only is it unacceptable, it's completely medieval. Okay. Hello, hi, I'm Isabel. I'm 19 and I'm from South Wales. I'm talking about creating jobs. You know, um, George Osborne personally said that he couldn't survive on a zero hours contract. The government say that they've created a thousand new jobs um, every day since gaining office. But, you know, these, these jobs aren't giving people security. They're not giving people a long term future. People, um, you know, at the beck and call of their employers, which isn't how it should be. They should have a relationship with their employers and know that they're safe for the future. And what do you think that can be done about that? Okay, yeah, Gavin Brown, over to you. I mean, there are more people in work in the UK today than there have ever been. We have an unemployment at about 5.5% when most countries around Europe are in double-digit unemployment. Two-thirds of the new jobs are skilled or highly skilled, and about three-quarters of them are full-time. So I think the, the track record of the coalition is generally pretty good. Just one word of caution on the, on the minimum wage, because we do have parties trying to outbid each other on uh, how much, whether it would be £8 or £8.80 an hour. I, I genuinely believe we're best to take the politics out of it and allow the low-pay commission, who were set up by the Labour government, maintained by the current coalition, to actually a group of experts, trade unionists, employers, employees and academics who look at all the facts and figures, they produce a 350-page report and they weigh up how can we increase wages for the maximum number of people without damaging their employment prospects and they, they reach a very balanced view which I think takes the politics out of it. Okay, what's, is that good enough for you? No, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't think that's good enough for me. You might be increasing the number of people in, in employment but if you look at the figures, you know, the number of people relying on food banks has tripled. You know, homelessness is up 50%. You might be getting people into work, but it's not the kind of work that is actually giving them a living wage. It's not the kind of work that people can survive on. And it's just not good enough to say, oh, well, we've given people a job. They might have a job, but it's not the kind of job that's giving them any quality of life. And employment isn't everything.
The three, the three main reasons. Hang on, hang on. The three main reasons I, I, for I people using food banks are benefit delays, but, people on low pay but, as well, but, and benefit changes. Do you accept responsibility but, 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 for that but, but, increase? But I think the point is this: the, the experts who take the politics out of it weigh up jobs versus the prospect of people getting jobs. So if you pushed it up to say overnight eight pounds an hour, to, 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 for example, or pushed it up to the living wage of seven eighty-five an hour mm -hmm. overnight. The view of the experts, who include trade unionists and academics, is that people would be out of work. We've so both asked you about food banks, though. Food banks, I've asked you about food banks. Do you accept responsibility for that huge increase in people using there, food there banks? There has been, and I think it's deeply regrettable that there's a huge increase. But it's, it's not regrettable, it's unacceptable. Let me answer the point, It's not regrettable, it's utterly unacceptable. Let me answer it's the point. It's not regrettable, it's utterly unacceptable. people queuing up for food, for milk, for bread? It's not The opposition politicians blame it entirely on the coalition government. But there has been an explosion of food banks across Europe. Germany, the richest country in Europe, has seen an explosion in food banks. Ireland has seen a huge increase in food banks. Every country across Europe has seen an increase in food banks. You cannot blame the coalition government for an increase in food banks in Germany or Ireland or other parts of Europe. You've got, you've got the responsibility people using here, Angela have Merkel. Been people, uh, and this is not you know, me making it up. It's benefit delays, benefit changes, people in low-paid jobs. But if, but if that is the case, why has there been an increase in food banks all over Europe? The, 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 point, the point is we, we saw the biggest, the biggest recession since the 1920s. The biggest recession since the 1920s. When the coalition government came to power, we had unemployment pushing 9%. We were borrowing £150 billion a year we didn't have. And the note left for the Treasury was there was no money left no money left. We were on the verge of bankruptcy as a country. And that has been turned around. The job isn't finished, but unemployment has been cut in half. The deficit has been cut in half and more people in work than there has ever been. One statistic I saw the other day, there have been more jobs created in the UK since the coalition government came to power than the whole of Europe put together. Okay. There is. Hi there. Johnny, uh, Johnny I'm from Glasgow. Um, travel through tonight and I've got one thing to say in relation to what's been said here we can't blame the coalition for what's going on we can't blame the West well austerity has been a pan-european project it has been a failed pan-european project all you have to do is google the word austerity and you will find academic article after academic article debunking it saying that it is Fairy tale economics, it's an absolute nightmare. And I just want to say about a story I heard soon after the credit crunch about a London stock market trader who said that every night he went to bed dreaming of recession because for him it was a massive money-making opportunity. Now, we've got people here who are talking about being on £3.30 an hour once the apprenticeship wage goes up. My brother was on £2.73 an hour in his apprenticeship last year, and yet we've got these London bankers, we've got these stock market traders making millions. And still, you pander the line that austerity is working, that we've got a long-term economic plan that's working. What's the justification for that now? Okay. Emily, I'm 23. Um, I'm originally from Northern Ireland, but I've been living in Edinburgh nearly five years. Um, every year, um, it comes round to that dreaded time of year where you get the notice at the door saying your rent's going to go up next month. And you know, I've gotten to the point where I've had friends of mine that have had to go to food banks. Like, you know, your level of accommodation goes down and down every year. How is this acceptable? Why are people being forced into like worse and worse levels of accommodation? And to the point where they have to go to food banks, they have to go for handouts just so they can keep a roof over their head. How do you think that that's acceptable? Okay. Jonathan Arnott, what would you keep doing? What would you do? Well, first of all, on the zero hours contracts question, we need to end exploitative zero hours contracts. So if you're in a situation where it's a public sector business, a big business, forcing people into a zero hours contract where they could and should be employing that person on a full time basis, and they're using that as a way not to guarantee uh, the employment that those people need, that needs to stop. We also need to recognise, and I think uh, it was uh, the, uh, the lad over there who was running the, the whiskey business, that if you're setting up a 
a small business in this country, sometimes you don't actually know. Uh, for the first few months, you don't know how many workers you're going to need, what hours you're going to need. So the key is to get it right and to end the exploitative side to zero hours contracts. In terms of housing, the problem that we've got is a supply and demand issue. If you don't build enough houses in this country, then you won't, then you won't, have, then you won't have enough houses, and that does cause a massive problem. One we of the we, are, we that are talking about housing later. Yeah, yeah. okay, okay. <laughs> Okay, all right. I'm sorry, I'm going to go on to housing if that's okay. Uh, hi, I'm Beck. I'm 23 and I live in Edinburgh. Um, I work for a homelessness prevention charity and I work every day with young people who have been threatened with homelessness or have experienced homelessness. Um, at the moment in Scotland, 60 young people every single day become homeless. Um, and I see that every day with young people staying in B&Bs, temporary accommodation, and accommodation that's just not acceptable um, at all. Um, and I just want to know what each of the parties, um, sort of as an undecided voter, what each of the parties are going to do um, to reduce the levels of youth homelessness in Scotland okay, and the UK. Uh, let's get a sentence from each of you. Let's go back to you, Jonathan Arnott. What well, we uh, for, for, for starters, we need to scrap <coughs> the bedroom tax. We need to make sure that young people are better off when, when they're in work. And we need to make sure that we're building enough houses in this country and make sure that the houses are there mm. and that they are affordable. That's more than a sentence, but thank Sorry. you. Daniel Alexander, <laughs> Lib Dems. Uh, firstly, we need to be building the number of houses that we need to accommodate all the people in this country. That means building 300,000 houses a year. Secondly, one of the big problems for a lot of young people looking to move out of home or to, to get a rented accommodation so they can't get the money together for the deposit on their property. So we'd put in place a new help to rent scheme which would provide up to £1,500, okay. £2,000 in London we to will, help young people will, get a deposit on so their home, house. Homelessness specifically uh, was the question. Gavin Brown. We, we, we have to, I mean, ultimately you have to see a big increase in home building and particularly uh, in affordable housing because otherwise rents and indeed mortgages keep going up. That, that is the ultimate way, uh, the only really way you can do it in the long term. Hamza Youssef, SNP. Well, let me commend you for the work that you're doing. Uh, you know, there's still too much homelessness uh, here in Scotland and I absolutely accept that. We've built more affordable houses than any other government in the past in Scotland, but we want to just not do it in Scotland. We want actually 100,000 affordable homes across the entire United Kingdom. But let me just say this to you. What won't help is if the Conservatives bring back that Thatcherite policy of right to buy, which will decimate social housing uh, across the United Kingdom. Okay. Jenny Mara from the Labour Party. As it's been in the news over the last few days, Ed Miliband is going to put, you know, caps and, and rent controls in place, which I think will help a lot of young people across the United Kingdom. Here in Scotland, Scottish Labour is committed to building 20,000 new homes across the country okay. and scrapping the bedroom tax across the UK. Chris, what's happening on social media? Loads happening on social media, and please keep them coming. Let's go through a few really quickly. Uh, this one from Chris. You asked for, like, one-sentence answers. Chris has one for the whole programme. Thanks for this. Zero-hours contracts are good for students. More graduate jobs are needed, and rent is rather expensive, says Chris. Show over. So thanks for the summary. <laughs> uh, Scott has also used the hashtag Newsbeat. Says the issue with increasing the living wage so quickly is that you put a lot of small businesses at risk. And a similar point here from uh, Judy as well who says increases in the minimum wage will encourage zero-hour contracts from companies who cannot afford it. Keep chatting. Hashtag Newsbeat. Thank you. Let's get some more of your stories. Hi. Hi, my name is Judy. I'm 24 and I'm from Edinburgh. I want to know why we're pandering to all these people who are like, I've just finished university, I can't get a job, and I can't afford a house. Like, I finished uni a couple of years ago. I've lived in about five different towns across Scotland and England. Um, you know, I've moved because I couldn't get employment where I'm from. I now live in a less than desirable area in Glasgow because I can't afford to live where I'm, like, where I'm originally from. Like, I don't believe the government should buy me a house. And now that I've worked hard and I've bought my own, why should I buy someone else one? Why can't they work hard and buy their own? When you, when like, you yes, say... Ambition, that's why you yeah. go to uni. When you say, why should you buy someone else one, what do, what do you mean? Well, like, I'm paying tax and stuff right. because people are like, oh, I can't afford a 200 grand, a, a 200 grand house because that's how the property prices are. Like, buy in a cheaper area. Like, you can't just leave uni and expect to get the best job you want and then live in a castle. Okay. Like, my job has nothing to do with my degree, but I've got a job, like, I work hard and I've got a house. Like, th surely that's just what people want. Like, why do I now have to, like, pay for people who can't be bothered to do that? Like, you know, I've moved all across the country. Like, some people are like, oh, I can't get a job in my hometown. Yeah, like, I'd love to live in my hometown, like, with my home friends, but I can't, and I can't afford it. So, move. Okay, if you can't afford where you live, just move. Do you agree with that? 
Um, sorry, I, I'm just going to ask a question about, um, I'm Eleanor, I'm from Edinburgh, um, and I'm really worried about um, energy bills. Mm -hmm. um, during the winter, we, most students I know have to turn their heating off um, and live in really, really cold homes. Mm -hmm. um, I want to know what politicians are doing to address fuel poverty, okay. um, considering it should be a major priority in cutting carbon emissions and climate change is the biggest mm -hmm. threat to our generation. You know what, we will come back to you in just a sec, but just to get a point, first of all, um, in contrast to yours, does anybody disagree with what you've just been hearing? Over there, okay, lots of hands are going up in the air. <laughs> Over there. Yeah. Um, I don't understand why you can say like you can just move around the country and get a job wherever you want. For uh, so many people, like they work in various sectors, and the jobs that are happen to the most amount of jobs happen to be in the most expensive cities. That's why London and Edinburgh have these like absolutely crippling like living costs. You can't just expect people to uproot their lives and like move all around. They shouldn't have to. People should get have the opportunity that they need wherever they are. It shouldn't depend on where you live. Okay. Uh, so I studied economics and law at uni and I work in a completely different sector. I work for a steel company. So that's because I couldn't get a job. So I'm not just going to sit like in my little town where I'm from and be like, I can't get a job. So I'm just going to work in the local shop. Like I've got ambition. So I'm going to get up and make something of myself. Okay. But not everybody has the startup capital to just get up and move. Some people need to have their family around. Some people need to have their family around them because they need that support. They can't just go off and live on their own and get a house. Some people actually need to live with their family, and it's, it's, like, you know, it's just like inconsiderate to expect someone to just get up and move. Okay. I'm Lewis, I'm a graduate, I'm from Aberdeen. I'm fortunate enough to be working in a job that is related to my degree, and I just want to build on what you were saying. Um, I agree with you. If there's no jobs in you, there's no point hanging about. They're not going to materialise themselves. You're going to have to find them on your own. But I'm in a position where I can save a menial amount, and it's going in a bank account and doing absolutely nothing. And OK, the flip side of that is that the interest rates and the mortgages are low. That means the bank's profits are low. -er. But the contrast to that is that you don't get anything in a savings account. And I'm sacrificing everything to put money away, and it's doing nothing. And the only thing that I got thrown as a lifeline this year was when the Tories announced that they were going to launch the help to buy ISAs. Mm -hmm. But, but that's, that's all lucky. well and good. But, you know, they have to get in, they have to get the budget. The only other thing that's been, that I've seen in the news recently was Labour said that they were going to knock stamp duty for first-time buyers for properties up to the value of £300,000. But that's fine. I live in Aberdeen where the average price of a one-bedroom flat mm. is £150,000. There's nothing I can do about that. Mm. But knocking stamp duty off isn't going to help me get there any quicker. I don't mind paying the tax. That's a weird thing to say, I know. Okay. But, <laughs> yeah. you know, the, the tax is there, you're going to have to pay it whether you like it or not. <laughs> it's getting started and it's not facing the harsh reality that I might be 28, 29, my God, 30, before I finally get away from my mum and dad. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um. Um, I think just picking up on what you said, you, you talked about people who are not scrounging, you didn't quite use that word, but people who uh, can't be bothered to get jobs. Well, I'm a product of social housing, I'm a product of, of a benefit-oriented family. I go to the University of Edinburgh and my parents are exceptionally proud of me. They didn't work out of, out of choice, they worked because my dad was injured and because my mum had to care for the family. And I think the notion that we should just move or we should, we're, we're scroungers somewhat because, because we can't afford to, to rent privately, we can't afford to, to buy our own home and save, and we are, uh, you know, um, taking money off the government. I think that's wrong. We need more affordable social housing. We need to end the right to buy scheme uh, in, throughout the rest of the UK. Obviously, it doesn't exist in Scotland, but we need to end that. We need to invest more in, in social housing uh, throughout the UK, like, um, all three of you guys have uh, proposed, so. Okay. Gavin Brown, can you enter that end, end right to buy? Yeah, all sure, of the I homes mean, that you're offering, um, will you replace each one that you offer? I mean, on, right on, 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 on the housing point, we've pledged to build 275,000 affordable homes so that we can actually get people into houses that need them. And there's a particular policy aimed at the under 40s buying for the first time. Because there is, uh, I think, a greater challenge for this generation than the generation before and the one before that for getting on the property ladder now. Since the crash, it has become harder. Despite lower uh, interest rates and lower mortgage rates, getting that deposit is tougher than it's ever been. That's why the government has brought in uh, help to buy, for example, to try and help that people get along so that they need a 5% deposit instead of a much larger one. You say That's that, but if, but if you're putting, you can put away, I think it's £200 a month, so it would take you five years, so 2020, before you'd save £15,000. Now, £15,000 for a deposit isn't going to get you very far in a lot of places. 
it, in some places it won't, but the, we've got the help to buy scheme, which allows shared equity, and then the idea of a help to buy ISA, which means every time that you're able to put some money away, the government backs that money up too. I think with the combination of those two things, we've seen it over the last couple of years, more first-time buyers, a greater number of first-time buyers for a long time as a consequence of that. I mean, in Scotland, we have uh, helped to buy at the moment, but it's only pledged until next year. Um, in the UK, it's pledged until 2020. I really hope in Scotland, the Scottish Government can give a commitment to keep it until 2020. Mm. Tell me, Alexander, does anybody actually know how many houses we need? House well, building's been in decline since the 60s. So these numbers, you say 300,000, yeah. 275,000, Labour say 200,000. That's just a drop in the ocean, isn't it? Well, I would say that I think the 300,000 figure that I've given is right. Of course, I would. No doubt others would say different figures are right. But when you look at... Um, uh, organizations like Shelter, for example, they think 250,000 houses uh, in England, that would be more like 300,000 across the UK. The point is that for decades we have not been building the number of houses we need. In terms of social housing, we've seen the, uh, the number of social houses fall in this country through the right to buy and other policies. It fell by 400,000 when Labour was in government, it's increased by... You say that the housing, house building reached its lowest level since the 1920s during the time that, sure, that you had right. a say in government. That's right, the absolutely. That was, a, that was a, as much as anything else, a consequence of the dire economic problems that we've been through and that we've been trying to recover from. But can I just address the young lady who made the point mm -hmm. about moving away to work? Because she's right, of course. A lot of people move to different parts of the country in order to get a job. My first job wasn't in the Highlands where I grew up. I moved away to... Uh, to, 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 to get a job. I'm sure that's true of many people. But what I'd say is, it is also right that when you're working hard and you start to earn some money, that you pay some money in, in tax. That tax money is there to help the obligations that we all have to, one an have to one another as part of a society and as part of a community. And that's why I think it is right that some of the money that comes in from people working hard like yourself is used to build houses, build social houses, build houses for people who can't afford to get on the, the housing ladder, as well as the many other things. And the key issue, I think, for government is to make sure that the amount of tax you're paying is fair. That's why I've been saying that we should increase the amount that you earn before you start paying tax, so that someone who's working hard on a low income keeps more of the money that they're earning for themselves. Okay, I did say that we would go back to energy bills. I know you asked a question about that before. Um, you've had a say in energy over the past five years. Why haven't you done anything? Well, in fact, we've done a, a lot on, on energy bills. Um, first, uh, Huge fines for the big six companies. Uh, just, just, a, just a couple Prices of, have just, a, just a year or so ago, we uh, reduced substantially some of the levies that go on electricity mm -hmm. bills to uh, reduce those costs. We've put in place a more competitive system for energy generation to help people with those costs too. We've invested in things like helping people to insulate their homes. There's a massive program called the Eco Scheme, which helps to insulate people's homes, particularly folk on lower incomes, so that they reduce their energy costs. And as the young lady at the back was saying, it's, also, it's not just good for individuals and their bills, it's also good for tackling climate change, which is why tackling climate change, sorting out the environment, is one of the five top promises on the front page of the Dem Manifesto. Okay, Gavin Brown, you want to freeze rail fares, why not freeze energy bills instead? People say that will only help people who are better off disproportionately. Well, I think the, if you freeze energy bills, you might be able to do well, it cut tuition fees you might, do able, something you might be able to do it temporarily, but then over time, they probably go up slightly faster. I mean, the coalition government removed some of the levies, uh, that, uh, the green levies that were on bills, and they paid them centrally. So that could, did cut the cost of energy bills slightly. Ultimately, though, you need a steady and stable supply of energy if you want to keep costs down. And I think that's why we've gone for a mix of energy products, including nu new nuclear, which I think is going to be required if we want to keep the lights on. It's about balancing the cost versus carbon emissions versus security of supply. Mm. And I think mm. uh, a, a, with a spread of uh, energy sources, I think we're better placed to but do that. But there is this generational equality where older people get triple lock pensions, own their own houses, get free bus passes, where young people pay unregulated rent, suffer benefit cuts and pay high tuition fees. Well, I think if, if, if you want to take the, you know, the pensions point, for example, I mean, I suppose that the, the theory behind that is that once people have retired, um, they're not in a position at all. Uh, you know, when they're in their 70s or 80s, it's much harder to actually generate any form of income and therefore the pension it does become the lifeline. I think in terms of um, uh, policies we've taken, we've taken as many policies as we can to cut the cost of living, whether that's energy bills, whether that's freezing council tax, whether that's freezing fuel duty, which it doesn't just cut the cost of uh, petrol in the tank, it cuts the cost of goods more widely. And over the last, I mean, I, certainly in the first couple of years, 
um, wages didn't keep pace with inflation. I think, uh, I think that's true. But over the last year or two, it has, and it's projected over the next couple of years, wages are projected to grow far faster than inflation, which obviously now is sitting at 0%, um, which means within the next couple of years, people will feel uh, the pound in their pockets far more than they have done okay, I want over to hear the last more couple. From you guys. Hi, um, I'm Zoe, I'm 18 and I'm from Largs, and I feel that bringing the cost of energy down for people is one of the priorities that needs to be made clear is that I think that you should insulate homes, focusing on getting funding to insulate homes, because not only does that, you know, protect the environment, it also reduces bills down. There's loads of statistics published on the, you know, the benefits of insulation. So instead of freezing gas and electricity prices, which is only a temp temporary effect, we need a long-term solution envir environmentally and socially. Jonathan, Anna. You kept, you kept us in believe in a lot of those policies. Your party wants to scrap the Department for Energy and Climate Change. Is that going to help cut bills? Look, our, our point in terms of renewable energy is that you need to make sure that the technology is there and affordable before you bring it in. What we've done in this country, what we've done, in, what we've done in this country, is we've done it in reverse. So, so to start off with, we've introduced a lot of wind generation before that was economically viable. That pushes everybody's energy bills up. In terms of the housing question that we've, that we've just had, um, UKIP is the only party uh, which, <laughs> which has got a clear plan on that. And the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors has said that we are the only party with a plan to uh, address the supply side. We need one million new homes in this country over the next 10 years. We need to do that on brownfield sites. How are you going to do that? Yeah. Well, you all of them you, on well, brownfield first sites. First of all, you, you, you have a national register of, of brownfield sites, which again is a Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors uh, point that, that, that they say that is necessary. And then you make sure that developers are incentivized to build on those brownfield sites so that we're not expanding more and more on our green belt. Now that makes a big difference in terms of housing. If you have the supply side right, then you can do an awful lot more and you stop the current logjam that we've got in the system. The question about uh, university earlier, we've got a big problem in this country at the moment because 47% of recent graduates are getting jobs if they're getting jobs at all, which are not graduate level. So we've got to go back and look at our university system and make sure that the university system meets the needs of industry. No, and no, so no, we're no, not no, training no, people in, in a number of the, the subjects that we need in, 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 the right, uh, in the right numbers. So we've got to encourage more young people, for example, into the STEM su subjects that will build our economy. And finally, uh, when, when, we talk about, uh, when we talk about people struggling to, uh, to afford to live on minimum wage, we need to raise the tax threshold. If you increase the minimum wage substantially, you cause two problems. One is business costs go up, so they put prices up. So you have the same problem again. The second problem you cause All when right. you try to increase the minimum wage is you put people out of work. So what we do, we increase the tax threshold to £13,000 a year. I know the Lib Dems and Conservatives have half copied UKIP's policy, which we've had since 2009. Okay. Well, we've had it since 2009. So <laughs> you can laugh all you like, but, uh, but we've had that policy for the last six years. How and by doing yeah. that, you want it a very, very quick response off. from you. A very, yeah, well, very well, quick you know, response First of all, I'm, I'm pretty surprised that UKIP didn't, didn't necessarily blame immigrants for high energy prices. So, uh, I'm pleased that we didn't do that. But the serious point. You know, Serious, serious, I'm, I'm pleased that Jonathan, I'm, you, I'm pleased you, that you're here you, in Scotland. You I'm pleased that you're here in Scotland. And, and look, I'll, I'll it. stay overnight, and uh, we'll take you up to some of the great wind farms that we've got here onshore, offshore. But my point is this: but do you that know we want to take costs? energy, we want to take the energy subsidy out of the bill, pay it by general taxation. That will bring uh, bills down. But let me also say that when it comes you to energy to sources, we've got a great potential here in Scotland for renewable technologies. Let's invest in that. What we also want to do is not just a moratorium on fracking here that we have in Scotland. We want it, we'll use SNP MPs to ensure that moratorium on fracking is across the entire United States. Okay, Chris, good timing. What's happening? Okay, hashtag newsbeats. And lots of you chatting online, like Charles, who says, my boyfriend has experienced this homelessness firsthand and the current accommodation he is in is disgusting. Uh, April has tweeted, why should people be forced out of their local areas? People aren't asking for a castle or fancy jobs, but a decent living. And Andrew, 
Yes, we can applaud tweets. We can definitely applaud tweets. Uh, and Andrew, lots of big promises being made. Makes me question where these politicians propose to get the money from. The hashtag is Newsbeach. We go to you, Jenny Mara. Uh, last time Labour had a go at government, they left a note saying there was no money left. Um, uh, the Institute for Fiscal Studies says there's a, an £18 billion hole in your manifesto. Where is the money coming from? Well, I think we have um, a very strong manifesto and we have um, a very good fiscal programme as well. I mean, Ed Miliband is um, one of the only leaders who has had the gumption to say that he is going to reintroduce the, the, the 50 pence rate of tax and we will use that tax, tax on properties over uh, £2 million. We are going to put several measures in place to uh, close taps loopholes loopholes for big businesses like Amazon and Google who aren't properly um, paying their taxes and that tax receipt will have a big dividend across the United Kingdom. It's going to be spent on nurses, on doctors, in the Time to Care Fund and Andy Burnham's put forward proposals on that basis. And here in Scotland, it's going to fund 1,000 extra nurses, 500 extra GPs. There's going to be a big fund for, for mental health care. And that all comes by redistributing this money from, that's raised from taxation across the UK. OK, well, housing, a hot topic online. Housing's a hot topic for our Newsbeat listeners as well. Let's uh, hear some more from them. We all need somewhere to live. <gasps> so it's no surprise that in our biggest ever survey of young people, Nearly a quarter said that affordable housing should be a priority for the next government. I'd love to be able to rent and one day buy my own home. But she's stuck sharing the room with me. Being a twin is great, but at the age of 23, who wants to share a room? I'd love to own my own house, but it's not going to be possible anytime soon. Owning a home is not a birthright, and it's probably the most expensive purchase you'll ever make. In other countries, renting is considered normal, and I don't know why it isn't here. One of the reasons I live at home whilst in uni is because my loan would barely cover a cost of accommodation and it would leave me nothing to live off. Saying we need more homes isn't especially controversial. Let's have a brownfield building revolution. Every young person who works hard, has a job, puts in, can save and afford a home of their own. We'll build homes again in our country. 200,000 homes a year by 2020. We just don't build enough homes. Simple as that. We just don't build enough homes. Labour, the Lib Dems and the Tories have all pledged to build more new homes if they get into government. There doesn't seem to be enough housing for young people. All I want is somewhere affordable, quite small and central. I worry about how I'll be able to rent or buy after I finish my degree. I have a number of friends living in Cardiff, still living at home despite having full-time jobs. This is a problem the UK has been facing for some time. With the number of new homes being built today, just half that of the post-war years. We didn't build enough homes. We didn't, last Labour government didn't build enough homes. We need to get to back to those houses as homes, not financial assets. No. The way things are going at the moment, I think very few people of my generation are going to be homeowners. I just can't see it being affordable. Homes aren't cheap, and of course not. It's a property. But if you save up and potentially go without something else, you may be able to get on the ladder. So what are the numbers? Well, the average cost of a home is £272,000, but of course, it varies massively depending on where you live, ranging from 150 grand in North East England to more like half a million in London. Even renting is really expensive. If you want to move property, you will often need two deposits as the rental periods will overlap. If you're earning minimum wage, Finding somewhere to rent in London is almost impossible. Now, on that minimum wage for over 21s, your £6.50 an hour equates to around 13 pounds grand a year, 12 grand after tax, so £1,000 a month. I spend half of that on your rent, and much of the UK is considered unaffordable. The easiest thing to say, and I'm, no doubt some politicians will say to you, is we're going to control rents, right? And that sounds really seductive, doesn't it? They're too high and all the rest of it. The problem is if you just sort of... If you, just start, if you just start forcing rents down as a government, of course, you have fewer and fewer people who are actually going to put up their own money to, to, to buy up properties and, and make them available for rent in the first place. Help to Buy was introduced by the Conservative government to reduce the deposit needed for first-time buyers. And the Conservatives are promising to build 200,000 new homes under this scheme if they get back into government, sold at a 20% discount. Labour plan to prioritise local first-time buyers in new housing areas, the Lib Dems want to build 300,000 new homes a year and create 10 new garden cities, while UKIP say they will build a million new homes by 2025. OK, how many of you guys feel like you'll be able to buy your own homes?
Well, I'm Danielle, I'm 23 and I'm from Edinburgh. Um, I'm currently 32 weeks pregnant and in temporary accommodation. This is my third time round being homeless. I'd just like to give you a wee figure. In Edinburgh this week, I'm looking for a two bedroom property for myself and my child, and there were 16 available. I don't want to know how many people are bidding at the moment. I don't want to know how many people are homeless in so Edinburgh hang on, at the Danielle, moment. Let's go back to you. How, how did you become homeless in the first place? Um, I was homeless at 16 due to mm. family breakdown. I was given a tenancy that wasn't sustainable in a really rough area in high flats, which you shouldn't put a 16 year old girl in or by herself because that sets someone up to fail. Mm. I was homeless for two and a half years after that, got a tenancy and now I've had to leave due to sort of personal circumstances mm. and I'm in temporary accommodation and I've been told that I could wait up to 14 months for a house. So I'm gonna be in a one bedroom flat with a newborn. How does that make you feel? It's it's embarrassing because like some people talk about scroungers. I'm not asking for handouts. I'm just looking for somewhere to raise my child. Mm. I'm not asking for anything special, just a house in a reasonable area that my child can go to school, nursery and feel safe and that mm. I feel safe in as well. Have you got any support or had any support? Um, there's, I work with an organisation at the moment, the Rock Trust. They've supported me now for 18 months. They're specifically tenancy support, but what these people have done for me is amazing. Like there's just generalists, hospital appointments, midwife appointments, housing appointments, everything. And as far as I'm aware, their funding gets cut all the time and that there really needs to be more support for young homeless people. Mm. Danny Alexander, what would your response be to Danielle? Well, I think it's a classic example of, of um, firstly, I think your, the situation you're in is terrible and you should be getting more support than you, than you have described. The classic example of why we need to build more social housing in this country, because the 16 properties that you're saying were available this week, no doubt hundreds of people um, uh, needing them, uh, is a consequence of the fact that there, there isn't a sufficient supply. There aren't enough houses of that sort available in this city and that's replicated all over the uh, United Kingdom. That's one of the reasons why uh, we would invest more to build more houses like that so that, that there's, there's more homes available for people like you who are in need. No one should have to raise their child in temporary accommodation. And so I hope very much that you'll get a home to live in, but more importantly, I hope very much that we'll get as a country to build the homes we need so no one's put in the situation that you're in again. But she's been failed. Yeah, well, I've just, I've just said that. Mm. Yeah, you're quite right. Now, housing is devolved, Hamza. What, why is that? That's not acceptable. No, why why is she in that position? You're absolutely correct. It's, it's not acceptable. Let me come up to you at the end of the show and take your specific details so we can see how we can uh, most certainly help you because you shouldn't have to. And, you know, I hope and wish you every best in the future. When it comes to housing stock, we're absolutely, absolutely doing our best here. We're on target to build 30,000 affordable homes. Mm. 23,000 of those uh, will be at least uh, for, for social rent. But that's not going to help you right here, right now, when you're having to bid. So let's let's see what we can do for you. Uh, but I think there's also something that we have to do with rent controls. I know that was mentioned. And so we've done got a consultation that's ongoing on that. We've promised to legislate by the end of uh, our parliamentary term in 2016. So every single one of you, I hope, that are here should be on that Scottish Government page, uh, getting involved in that consultation uh, that's ongoing. But let me take your details. It's, it's not acceptable. Uh, and, and absolutely, we, that's why we need to be building more homes right across the United Kingdom. Thank you. Okay. Do you want, can I get your response to, to what you've just, like just to heard? Say thank you. It's nice to actually have someone listen because you don't feel like young homeless people are mm. literally one of the least listened to groups of people in society. And it's nice to know that people actually genuinely mm. do care. But action would be better than words, I'm Definitely. sure. Definitely. Okay. Hi, I'm Ryan. I am, I'm 24. I live in Edinburgh and I graduate next month. Now, I'm lucky enough to have secured a graduate job here in Edinburgh but myself and my boyfriend are starting to save to buy a house. Now, we both have pretty well-paid graduate jobs. You know, we're not going in at minimum wage. It's not loads of money, but it's enough to live off. But it's certainly not enough to start saving for a deposit for a house, even though we've got two incomes and, you know, a deposit for two people. It's still going to take us years and years and years. Like someone over there said, we just don't have the option of living at home and being supported by our parents. In order to work, we have to be here and we have to pay out the rent. What can you do to support people like us that are in a position that we just can't move, you can't pick up and move to go somewhere that's got lower housing rates, but we're doing everything that we can? Okay, well, we'll get some responses from the politicians. I want to hear more of your stories first, though, before we do. Uh, 
my name's Lance, I'm 23, student from Leeds. Um, my point, uh, again, this debate is getting to me because we've gotten to the point where uh, greenfield sites or, or green belts are pretty, pretty much pushing up prices in cities. Pretty much, a green belt is basically a, a section of land that surrounds cities. They're in every, they're, they cover every single city here in the UK. And pretty much, it's, it's a simple supply and demand issue. We don't have, the land is scarce. We're not building on enough, on enough, in enough places. Rent controls aren't gonna work. Uh, uh, building on brownfield sites isn't gonna work either because, again, it's expensive. Why are we not think, why are we not being creative? Why are we not hearing about politicians actually doing something about building? It, it's, it's, someone just do something. You know, it, it's getting to us. We're all here. Rent literally takes up half of our income. We're here, we're stuck here. Please do something. What do, you, what do you make of the things that you have heard? Help to buy, right to buy. It's, it's not enough, like I said. The, targets the, for house building. Green, like I said, green belt sites. The, the fact that we have green belts here. With, I mean, 6.8% of, of the UK is built on. 68 And we still have outdated green belt land that was created in, in, uh, after World War II. Why do we still have it? Let's build on it, come on. We, we can be green at the same time as building on Greenfield sites. I mean, come on. Okay. I'd like to go uh, back to the lady over there who is in the temporary accommodation. Uh, I know that it's not a one-off story. I've had about a close friend of mine in exactly the same circumstance that you're in, and the housing that she was put into was atrocious. Uh, it was full of drug users. Uh, she'd bring up her, I think, month-old child, and she was in there. She was on to the council every day, on to people to help. Where and did she live? Uh, where did she live? Mm -hmm. uh, in Grange just outside Falkirk. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that she was in there for nine months, nine months in temporary accommodation, living like that with people chapping on the door, she was scared to even go out into mm -hmm. her close. Uh, and you shouldn't, you shouldn't be made to live like that. Something needs to be done about the housing and especially social housing in this country. And in fact, there was an article I believe published today that mm. says the housing in this country is below UN standards. It's ridiculous. Something needs to be done about it. Okay, thank you. My name is Laura, I'm 21 and I live in Glasgow. My question's for the Conservatives. I'm wondering why you want to bring back the right to buy scheme, despite over the, fact, over the last 10 years, it's been recorded that 50,000 homes have been lost because of this and bigger enterprises can buy out these houses, making them unaffordable for people, which forces people to be put into derelict areas and further isolating them. We, we, want, we want to bring it back or to continue in the rest of the UK. Obviously, in Scotland, we can't. It's been abolished in Scotland. We right. want to God extend it. it. We want to extend it in the UK because people aspire to own their own home. And having a policy like Right to Buy opens it up to more and more people. 20, 30, 40 years ago, the aspiration to own your own home was so much more difficult before the Right to Buy came along. I think it was a policy that opened up the ability to own your own home to tens, if not hundreds of thousands of families across the country. And I don't think it's right that families are now denied that in Scotland. Gavin, how many, young people, the, the, how many the, young people, the, Gavin, how the, many people do you think under the age of 30 benefit from right to buy? Well, and, and the availability, I, well, of, I think the ability I, to buy on your own home shouldn't just be limited to people who w uh, live in housing association properties, which is what's being proposed. Oh. As the lady over here was saying, people should have that opportunity. They're able to save. And that's what the help to buy scheme uh, does, but also we've got an idea about rent to buy. The idea being that if you rent a property, that over time, over a number of years, you can build up a share in that property and eventually own it outright. So renters can become owners through the process of renting. That's an idea that Liberal Democrats will put in practice if we get elected next time. You asked the question, are you happy with that response? No. <laughs> Why not? Why not? 50,000 houses. I mean, your policies are all about building more houses to keep up with the demand of more people, yet you're letting 50,000 50, houses be lost, and why not? Yes. <laughs> but but, but, but those, those houses aren't lost. People are living in those houses. But they're still. not. It's not as if the houses have disappeared. I'm not saying the houses have disappeared, but people, some people can't afford the right to buy scheme, and other people are coming in and buying their houses. So these people have to move to more deprived areas, which builds on the stereotype of some people who live in social housing. So it's not. But I, I just don't see why. I don't see why this. 
The point is, it's depleting I, I don't, I don't social housing stock, so unless you're going I, to replace each one I, I don't like for like. I don't see why this generation, and particularly people in Scotland, should be denied the right to own their, their council house or their housing association house. That was a right that was given to their uh, forefathers and generations before them. Okay. I think we're taking... Yeah, and what I'm not hearing from the Conservative Party on okay, this John. is if you have a right to buy scheme, then you need to make sure that the money is put into a separate pot and for every house that is sold under right to buy, you are building a new house. And you have to say that in order to have that scheme and you're not saying it. And you should be. Is that what UKIP would do? Yes, it would. Yeah, it is. Hi, my name is Charlie. I'm 21 and I'm from Aberdeen. My question is for the Conservatives as well. Under your government, you're planning to scrap 18 to 24 year olds' job seekers' allowance if they've been on job seekers' allowance for six months or longer and put them into 30 hours a week of unpaid work. The only other group of people we do that with in society is community service. Why are you punishing people for being unemployed? I don't think we're punishing people at all. We want to see full employment in this country. We've seen an extra two million jobs over the last five years. We want to see another two million more over the next couple of years. We want genuine full employment in this country for all age groups. Okay, at the well, moment, why not extend have, it to all claimants youth, then? We have youth unemployment of 16%, which is far too high. It was 22% two or three years ago. We've done everything in our power to bring that down and we've, we've cut the jobs tax for people under 21, we're cutting the jobs tax for apprentices under the age of 25, we're creating, we have created two million apprenticeships over the last course okay. of government, we, we're, we're running, aiming we for are three out of time. million more over the next course of government, we Do want full employment, yeah, that's what we're see, aiming for. I don't for. see where the dignity is in it, I don't understand yeah. how the you are, you're encouraging people, you're, you're, you're not encouraging people, people. you're addressing people, that's what you're doing. Okay, let's, let's try and fit in some more comments, hi. Hi, I'm Darren, I'm 21 and I'm from Newcastle. Now, I grew up under a Tony Blair's government um, and now over the last five years we've had the Tories. Um, I'm a fashion student and, and in order dance. to wear, and the Lib Dems, who are fab. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm a fashion student and in order to get into the industry you have to work in London unpaid for about six months. Mm -hmm. yeah. I can't afford to do that yet I grew up under Tony Blair who spoke of an aspiration nation yeah, right. and the yeah. Tories do that now as well. What is aspirational about people with the merits who can't afford to work in London for six months unpaid in a form of slave labour? Yeah. What are we to do? Just settle in the North East? Jenny Mara. This is I think it's a point very well made and this is yeah. why you know Ed Miliband has said that there needs to be a level of rent control because it is one of the most unfair things that people in Scotland lots of them move to Aberdeen to get jobs but jobs in low paying jobs they, then the rent goes up so they're losing less and less paid. of Not their income paid. but you're in a situation and that's why under Labour we introduced uh, flats for, for key workers you know for policemen for nurses but you're in a situation where you would need cheap accommodation and that's why there's got to be accommodation available at all levels to suit all needs. Mm. Rent controls but have been criticised as well. A very quick point from you. Um, We're running out of time. Hi there, my name is Amy Robertson. I'm a 21 year old student from Edinburgh. On the topic of housing and jobs for vulnerable people, I'd like to bring up a sector of society that's forgotten about because as the UK becomes the imprisonment capital of Western Europe, my family and families across the country are seeing the real effects of what austerity Britain does to a life where we have no opportunities. Now, okay. What I would like to ask all the politicians tonight is what would you do to help support people that have done their time coming out of prison or young people at risk of offending so we do not create a cycle of poverty in our country again? Okay, well, we probably don't have enough time to get your answers for that one. Do we have any time to get in a couple of online comments? We can really, really quickly go through a couple of tweets. Hashtag Newsbeat is trending, so please do keep chatting. Uh, Tom wants to uh, get money for public services and housing by putting MPs on minimum wage. Uh, and Dee says, I've got two degrees and would love to work, but I've been demonised as all people on welfare have. Keep your benefits, says Dee. Give me a job. OK, uh, that is it from the final Newsbeat election debate. Tomorrow night at 5.45 on Radio 1 and One Extra will continue with our leader interviews. And check out our YouTube channel for anything else you want to know about the election. Find out what MPs do all day and get our A to Z of politics. Thanks, Thanks. to everybody here in Edinburgh tonight. Indeed. Thank Thanks. you very much. Thanks.